So the question of the day is, are Toyotas made in Japan better than those made in North America or elsewhere? This is a question that my viewers ask me all the time and the answer to that question has been kind of all over the place. In today's video, we're going to clarify, is there any truth that Toyotas made in Japan are far superior and better and more reliable than those made elsewhere. Now, a little bit about me. My name is Ahmed. I am a Toyota Master Diagnostic Technician with over a decade of experience. I work on these cars every single day. I currently work at a Toyota dealership. And joining me today to give you kind of a three-dimensional view from the service side and the engineering side is my good friend and awesome automotive engineer, David. Hi, David. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for inviting me, Ahmed. Thank you, David. So, David, tell us a little bit about your experience in, as an automotive engineer with Toyota, so the viewers would have a better understanding of your background. Of course, sure. Yes, uh, I was born and raised in Japan, but uh, I was educated in the U.S. and Canada, and I have been working in the automotive engineering sector for now over 35 years. That includes uh, product development, manufacturing, testing, and evaluation. And so I used to work for a variety of different car companies, including Toyota, Suzuki, General Motors. Uh, and I'm an advisor on a number of different things to do with auto industry or transportation industry. And so I've had uh, my entire life dedicated to uh, developing and designing and manufacturing of cars and evaluating those things. So I have a different perspective perhaps from others. And of course, I'm a big fan and a supporter of Toyota. So those are the stuff that I focus on my channel at uh, Automotive Press. So thank you so much for inviting me. I do have a mechanical engineering degree. I studied at MIT in Boston, um, but really my life is all about uh, understanding how Toyota develops and engineers and design cars and to explain how those things impact people. And so I'm here to hopefully add some value to your channel. So thank you again, Ahmed. Thank you so much, David. Folks, David also has a YouTube channel, Automotive Press. I invite you to check it out, subscribe to it if you like it. He has really good content there. And before we dig into the subject matter of this video, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. If you are a returning subscriber, well, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. And without further ado, let's get right into it. So first, let's identify the different kind of problems that we could have with a car. First, there is the engineering and design issues. Second, there is the part supplier issues. Third, there is the production and the assembly issues. Now let's kind of dive in a little bit on the engineering design issues. These are issues that are kind of conceived at the birth of the car. This has nothing to do with production, nothing to do with who made what. These are designing issues, things that will actually show up later down in the life of the car because after all the extensive testing that Toyota does, some of these issues still escape through. One emphasis on this issue is this will not affect production. This has nothing to do with production. This is basically on the prototypes and on the design of the car. Now the part supplier issues, this is basically the part supplier. They have their internal issues with quality, with whatever the case may be. Toyota is actually, in my opinion at least, very harsh on their suppliers and very demanding because it's a big company. They're very A plus on quality. So they're really harsh on their suppliers about quality. Now the production and assembly will leave as we progress in the video, because this is the main meats and potatoes of this video. But David, what do you think about the engineering issues and the part supplier? How does that play part in everything? Right, so a couple of things to keep in mind. One is if the product is brand new from scratch and it's all new, there are going to be more engineering and design issues than if it was a modified version of something else. So it depends a lot on the history of the product but also there is a, there's a thing called DFA, which is called design for assembly. So engineer is supposed to create the part or design the part so that it's easier to manufacture down the road. So that philosophy is very much intact at Toyota and they're supposed to be really working through that. But as you mentioned, you know, a few things always uh, just fall between the cracks and there are always some parts that don't quite fit correctly. Now, some of it is to do with the supplier because uh, Toyota will outsource the design and engineering of some of the parts to the suppliers, especially larger one. 
who we call tier one suppliers, and they designed the components. So even if Toyota did everything they can to build the, and design a best car or truck, it's possible supplier could have screwed up. So you have a couple different areas where the engineer or design can, can be a little bit messed up and it's not caught until it hits full production and either the parts don't fit correctly, like that's the most common problem is the mating of the parts. It, it all fits fine in engineering and prototype, but in mass production, it doesn't quite align properly. That's a common issue. Or just functionality wise, uh, it was a, maybe a complex component or new component, and therefore uh, it just, you have some issues once they start to being produced. So those are some pot potential things. I think the the first year, you know, people say if don't buy the car first year because of design issues. That is not a, not so true for Toyota because at Toyota they do so much prototyping about a year longer than the rest of the manufacturers that when the production start, then it's not really a first year production anymore. I talk about this in my channel quite a bit, uh, but. First year of production for Toyota is more like second year for other manufacturers because they've been testing for so long, right? Uh, nevertheless, there could be and there always will be some issues in the first couple of years. Now, as you know, Ahmed, they go through what, what they call um, uh, running changes. So throughout the first two years, they make a whole bunch of changes on the production side to accommodate for engineering problems. Um, but that takes place throughout the, throughout the year uh, and until such time that a more difficult engineering change will be held until the refresh or facelifting time, usually three to four years down the road. And there they will correct all of the mistakes they made in the first few years that they could not correct before. And so, you know, if you're asking me, is it better to buy after the facelift or before the facelift? Of course, it's better to buy after the facelift. But having said that, you know, even the very first year, the problems are typically uh, very minimal for Toyota. You know, my wife purchased uh, the very first RAV4 in 1997, if you could believe that. We kept it for 21 years, Ahmed. Oh, wow. And <laughs> very first year, and he had zero problem, right? It, it ran flawlessly for 21 years. But of course, back in those days, cars were also simpler. Nowadays, everything with hybrid and technology and autonomous technology and stuff, it just makes it more complicated. And so the biggest problem we're facing these days is not so much the hardware engineering, it's the software en software engineering. Uh, that's the where, where all the bugs are because they can't quite get all of that sorted out before the introduction. So those are some of my thoughts. Commenting on what David said, with Toyota, here's a small advice from my opinion. Try avoid buying the first few months of production, like maybe up to three, four months. For example, we are now, as the date of filming this video, in the month of September. Now you're going to start seeing 2022 models. But if the Tundra, even though the Tundra will come out in December, that's a little late, but if the Tundra were in normal times and would come out today, I would wait until we're actually in 2022 before I buy it. Now I know the uh, temptation to jump in the greatest and the latest and buy it in the year before, but this is where you give them a small window to figure out the small things from all the three sections. So, are the Japanese-made Toyotas immune to all of these problems, the supplier, the engineering design issues? Well, as we said, the design and engineering issues, they're not really related to where the car is made, assembled, finally, it has to do with the design, but Parts supplier problems. Let's clarify a couple things here. Japanese made Toyotas don't all have parts from Japanese suppliers 100%. Toyota will utilize a lot of suppliers across the world that they trust. And just like I mentioned, they have a very stringent quality control of these suppliers. Toyota is a very heavy customer. They're difficult because they have very high standards and they push their suppliers to the limit when it comes to that. The other thing is American assembled or North American assembled Toyotas will have Japanese parts in them, par Japanese supplier parts. So it's really a mix and match across the whole, the whole lineup. But David, this is also your department a lot. So tell us a little bit about how these parts suppliers, how were the parts are coming from, how are this impacting the final product? Mm -hmm. 
Good question. So as you know, with all the supply chain issues we have lately, it's a very complex situation now, right? And we talk about the supply chain being global, but it's, it is so complex, you won't believe it because you could have a Japanese supplier in Japan supplying parts to Japanese product in Japan. That's a straightforward case. But you could also have a Japanese supplier located in North America uh, supplying parts for either Japanese brand or North American brand. And you can have, as you mentioned, either European or North American parts manufacturer uh, building or uh, providing parts in Japan, Europe, or US. So you've got this crazy complex situation where you don't really know exactly which part is being produced by whom and where is it coming from. So until you take an actual car or truck and break it apart into piece by piece and figure out exactly where it's made and which supplier is being uh, involved, sometimes you can't even figure out the exact content of the cars. Now, you, there is a way to find out the percentage of the local content, what we call local content. So you could find out if, uh, for example, uh, some uh, North American cars have so much foreign component is classified as a foreign import. And you also have Japanese cars that have so much local content that it is considered an American model. And so those are some interesting stuff. But in terms of defective st things, people don't realize that Toyota has the exact same standard regardless of where it's produced for one. And they have the exact same standard for suppliers as they do for their own internal component. So it doesn't matter if it's a US or European supplier or Japanese supplier, engineering and providing parts for Toyota in Japan or elsewhere, they have the exact standard that is a very high caliber. So I don't think you can just judge uh, based on where it's made in terms of supplier uh, or which supplier. I will say that some supplier, which is owned by Toyota, like Denso or Aishin, I mean, Toyota owns how many, 200, more than 200 suppliers of some sort, uh, will likely have a little bit better uh, advantage than maybe those suppliers that are not owned by Toyota at all because of the direct influence that Toyota have. So for example, oftentimes um, Toyota senior engineer, when they are re reaching a retirement age, they're actually moved on to the supplier base they end up working as advisor to those suppliers. That's why you get such a good workmanship in some of the Japanese supplier because of the direct Japanese sensei experience. The sensei means teacher. Uh, but generally speaking, there is very little difference. As long as the supplier meet the requirements of Toyota and they're supplying the parts in such a way that it's easy to manufacture, which is the DFM, DFA, uh, I talked about earlier, design for assembly, design for manufacturability. As long as they meet all of that standard, it could be built in Japan, it could be built in Europe or US, and it will be reliable and dependable. Um, so I, the difference between or among suppliers based on where they're located are very minimal, I think. So another example of this, and, and just like David mentioned, the content of parts in a car. Actually, in the United States, and this could be in Canada and other parts of the world as well. I am in the United States. I'll share this example with you. When the new cars come, there is a sticker on the window that tells you what, what are the percentages. And usually, you'll see, you know, North American parts, this percentage, Japanese parts, this percentage, and then they'll say others. Here's an example of that. You know, this, this will give you an idea of where the majority of parts came from, but still you can't really just go and find exactly what happened. Actually, one method internally to know if there is an actual parts, completely different part between a Japanese made car and a North American made car is to look at the parts catalog. Sometimes you'll It'll ask you in the parts catalog, is this a Japanese made or this is a North American? And when you go and you see it for the same part, a completely different part number, there might be something different. But from experience, I'll share this with you. This used to be the case in the early 2000s, maybe up to 2007, 2008, you'd still see those. But lately, I really haven't seen that. I mean, there sometimes were completely different function. And I'll give you an example. 2000 and 2001 Camry. 
The Japanese model has a completely different rear caliper design than the North American model. And in my professional opinion, and this is going to shock you, the Japanese model has a terrible design rear caliper. Notorious to stick, has only one pin at the bottom that is removable, and you have to kind of twist the caliper and move it. The North American model has two pins that are removable. It's much easier to service. It's a lot it functions much better, especially in a rust situation when you live in, in a salt belt area. But this is one example of in the past how you used to see a physical difference between the Japanese and the North American market. But these days, they're identical. The things that are, I don't remember the last time I looked up a car after 2007 that had different part numbers. So, you've watched this video this long, we come to the moment of truth. Are Japanese-made Toyotas assembled or built better than elsewhere? Well, I'm going to actually direct that question to the expert in Toyota production system. David, what do you think? That is a very interesting question. Uh, no, I have been to most of the factories, uh, not just with Toyota, with other car companies as well. So I've been, to, I've been to almost all the factories in Japan, most of the factories in North America, and also a whole bunch of them in Europe. And I study them very carefully as part of, that's part of my why work that I do. Um, so I can tell you first of all, in terms of mainstream Toyota products, not brand new models that just came out or brand new factory. If you just compare side by side, something similar, like let's say a RAV4 built in Japan versus a RAV4 built in Woodstock, Ontario, there is very little difference because number for a number of reasons. One, they again, they meet the exact same standard. We call them a uh, number of different things, but SOP, standard operating procedure, is identical. The workers are trained the same way. In fact, when if there is a new model introduced in North America that was previously built in Japan, the workers have to go to Japan to study, and they will bring some of the Japanese senior managers to back to the US or see elsewhere to train and to uh, mentor them. So there's lots of cross-functional training back and forth. So unless it's a brand new model in a brand new factory, um, unless that's a different story, uh, if it's a, something that's being built in both countries like a RAV4, there's very little difference almost. In fact, I would uh, question whether you can find any difference in terms of defects, reliability, dependability. Now, I will say that there is subtle difference in uh, not so much fit and finish, but more into uh, in terms of aesthetics. So, for example, we have uh, my wife now has a um, 2021 RAV4 Prime. That Prime is built in Japan, but uh, one of my other company car is a 20, uh, 2020 RAV4, which is built in Woodstock, and they're both the exact same color, the, the pearl white color. And if you look carefully, uh, there is just a very subtle difference in terms of gloss and the way the paint was applied, but it's not a functional defect and it has nothing to do with reliability or dependability. And same thing with the plastic injection molding parts you see inside the car. If you look really carefully with a trained eye, you can tell that uh, the way the molding uh, and the texture works, uh, there's always a little bit of difference I noticed between the Japanese one and uh, built, those built somewhere else. But again, it has nothing to do with reliability or the quality of the material. They're all same standard. Um, but is there a minor difference? There is, but um, it doesn't add up to anything to do with defects, right? So they're both reliable. They, if you actually measure the what we call the um, defects per million or defects per car, there's a number of different measurements that we do. It's typically almost identical with thing like 1% of each other uh, among the Japanese built one versus let's say those one built in the US or Mexico. Uh, there's no more than, not more than half a percent to 1% difference. And those differences are typically more aesthetics uh, and again, not functional. But to answer that question, if you're looking at dependability, reliability and basic fit and finish, you will not notice uh, any difference between Japanese ones and others. And also I know people have sometimes concern about factories in Mexico. Um, just because people are maybe a little bit biased sometimes. They want Japan, number one. They want North America built cars, number two. They might put Mexico as a third option. But I've, I've known a lot of people that work for um, factories in, in Mexico, and they actually tell me they have some of the best manufacturing practices and people are very diligent. Uh, and um, I would, again, say that there is no difference between 
those built in Mexico and the U.S. I know people are very concerned about the Tacoma production moving from San Antonio, Texas to Mexico. I don't think you need to worry at all. It's a really well-built factory. And so, yeah, so those are some of my comments, uh, Ahmed. I don't know if you agree or not, but over back to you. Oh, David, I agree 100%. And uh, I'll, I'll give you more of, of the fit and finish examples. And, and this, is, this is something I see and I know about and it doesn't bother me one bit. I have bought multiple North American made Toyotas and actually I am currently waiting as the data film in this video for a North American model to be delivered to me. The, the fit and finish, let me define this to you as, as a consumer, how you would see this. If you look at the paint, not the paint quality, not that you're going to get patches that are not shiny and the thing is all over the place and the color don't match. That is not it. But we're talking about when you look at the paint with a very strong light that is designed to inspect paint, you might see a speck or two throughout the whole car. I've seen this. I had, again, you need a trained eye. You can't just be looking at the car under the sun after you washed it. That is not a way to check paint. But then you go at the panel gaps. Now, we're talking half a millimeter difference. I can see this. David can see this. Many consumers won't even see this, won't even notice it. But again, if the hood, for example, the hood gaps on the sides, if this side has half a millimeter bigger gap than this side because the hood is slightly sitting this way, well, that is not going to affect the car, especially after the first accident where all the gas will be all over the place. Simple, honest truth, this is really it. You look at the dashes, there might be a quarter millimeter gap in one of the panels because of the injection molding and all this stuff. Uh, but you look at the engine, the engine is the same, the, the transmission is the same, the big ticket items, let's say, are the same. So I am not really convinced that you must buy a Japanese built car if you want this car to last two, three hundred thousand miles. I think that has more to do with your ownership and care of the car more than where it's made. And th this plays a much bigger impact than where the car was made. And remember, we are buying Toyotas. Toyotas have some of the highest standards in the industry. Now, they might be not the most thrilling car to drive, people call them all kinds of things, but when it comes to reliability and durability, they are king. And that is as simple as that, is a purpose-built car for that purpose, and they do that very well. They're not gonna compromise on their quality and their reputation just because they have a new factory. It's not like some other manufacturers <clears throat> that, uh, you know, So the final verdict, you know, this is not my personal opinion. This is going to be my professional opinion. I work on these cars. I see them when they come in. I've dealt with the design issues. I've dealt with production issues, part supply issues, and I've reported it. We have an internal system, DPRs, dealership product reports. This gives Toyota kind of feedback from the ground so they can follow up. I have been to the Kentucky factory before, for example, that's the closest one here. I have seen those same DPRs that we make hung on the wall in the factory so they can implement changes. Now, one thing about, about this whole thing, yes, there is a very subtle difference between fit and finish, mainly appearances, cosmetics, between Japanese assembled made Toyotas and North American or others. But I see what people have to go through to custom order that one model that is, let's say a RAV4, instead of getting one that is right off the lot, although that is not the case these days with the shortage, but normally people leave the 20 RAV4s on the lot and they custom order one. They have to wait for months and months and months to get that one made in Japan. But really that hassle, and potentially pay more for it, of course, that hassle is not worth it. For, for this tiny little difference that you are getting, it is not worth it. Would I buy a Japanese-made car that I could have otherwise bought in North American? I would not. That is now we're moving into my personal opinion. I've owned many North American Toyotas, and I didn't think twice when buying it. Where the car is made shouldn't be a factor in your purchase, honestly. What should be a factor in your purchase is who you are buying it from, Toyota 
others. And the most important thing about your car ownership experience is you and the maintenance. People will focus so much on buying this Japanese made car and then they go on to neglect it. And then when it have serious issues at five to 10 years, they start complaining about the whole brand and they say it was all for nothing. No, you need to maintain your car. Some people have this mentality of just because it's a Toyota, I can neglect it and it'll be okay because it's quality. That is not the case. Please take care of your Toyotas and then it doesn't matter where they're made, they're still a Toyota. Well, David, what are your final verdict or closing thoughts on this? Right, well, uh, put it this way, I own a 2021 Tacoma TRD Pro, which is built in San Antonio, Texas. That's my uh, daily daily driver. And my sort of fun car I have is a Toyota Supra, which as you know, is built in Austria by a Canadian supplier, a Canadian company called Magna, but it's mostly BMW components, right? So I'm the person who should be most picky about uh, the type of car I should buy. And neither of my cars are built in Japan. So that's uh, one, one indication that I'm not concerned about uh, buying cars that are, that are not built in Japan and it will not come into my uh, decision-making process where, where it's made. I will say that uh, what's more important, as you mentioned before, Ahmed, is you know, how new the product is and whether the factory is new. So you typically speaking, you don't want to buy from a brand new factory just because the workers are still being trained and while you have a senior management looking over everything, uh, you, could, you could still have some issues. So that I will say it could be a potential concern. You also uh, want to avoid buying the car in the very first six months of the product life cycle. Usually after six months, a lot of issues have been taken care of and it's quite safe, uh, especially for Toyota. So I will say those two things. But in terms of comparing different countries of origin, uh, because the supply chain is all mixed up and you don't know, for example, if you buy a product made in Japan, where the components actually come from and vice versa, if you buy a, a car or a truck in, that's built in North America, well, the components could come from anywhere. And because it's so hard to determine anyway, this mix and match approach uh, makes, it, uh, makes it irrelevant where it's really made. Uh, also because they all meet the same standard Toyota has. And the standard is applied not just to their manufacturing, but to their supplier, tier one supplier, which is a major component, and even to tier two and tier three suppliers, which are smaller suppliers. That standard carries all the way through the su supply chain. So it doesn't matter where it's built or what model it is. If it's a Toyota or a Lexus product, you know for sure that it's going to meet all that high standard, high caliber of standard. So I'm not concerned about uh, where it's made and neither should, should the general consumers, they shouldn't make decision based on that, uh, other than those few things we, we talked about earlier. So um, if you look at, uh, of course, the final, final examination or final audit comes in the form of different surveys, right? Whether it's a consumer report or other companies that are doing some kind of audit. And while they're not super accurate, you can see that um, all the Toyota products or Lexus product has uh, in the top, top 5%. So again, it, it didn't matter if they were built in San Antonio or they were built in a Kyushu factory in Japan. Uh, they are in the top three to 4% or 5% of the quality standards. So it's all safe, it's all good. Uh, choose the car you want, buy the car you want, and don't worry too much about where it's built. That's sort of my last advice. Thank you so much, David. Well, folks, you have the truth from two relevant people in this. I am not just saying this because it's the fashion or the trend. This is the God honest truth from our professional opinion from actual real world experience. I would like to give a huge shout out to David. Thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Guys, make sure that you check out his channel, Automotive Press on YouTube. David is is a great friend and a brilliant engineer and I'm so honored and humbled to have to know you and have you on the channel. So thank you so much. Thank you. Honor is all mine. Uh, I, mean, it's, uh, I just love your channel. I love all the things that you're doing and uh, we both have the same passion for cars and trucks and all things to do with uh, Toyota. So thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you, David. All right, guys, well, now you know the truth. I hope this helps you with your future purchase of Toyotas and kind of understand what happens with, with the production cycle. If you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. 
If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next videos, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.